Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective. We're starting off here looking at the ThinkPad X61S and I have done a video which you can see over here on this machine but it's not the machine that we're going to be looking at today but I have provided it for scale. Most people would say that this is a very very small ThinkPad and they would be right especially in the North American market. However, what if I were to tell you that there is a smaller ThinkPad, one that is actually a little bit tinier than the X61? So if we put this on top, you can clearly see that there is a smaller footprint for this device, especially on the length and a little bit on the width. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the ThinkPad 240X, which belongs to the 200 series of laptops and the 240 is one of the last smallest ThinkPads. Now what I mean by that is the other in the 200 series are smaller than this one, with the 240 being the largest. These were pretty much the smallest that you could get. Now, some might argue that the PC110 Palm Top is the smallest. However, it's not really a ThinkPad. It wasn't really marketed as such, even though there are definitely design uh, similarities between the two. That cannot be argued. So the 240, and this is the 240X specifically, all of these models were released in June of 1999 and they were produced until February of 2001. This 240 variant came in a 240, a 240X, which we see here, which had a better CPU option. We had the 240Z, which was faster CPUs, better display, pretty much all, all around the Cadillac. And then there was also an i-series variant, which was called the 1124, which was very similar to the Z uh, suffix and had a silver case rather than the traditional black case. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the specifications of this unit. So these came with a Intel Celeron 450 megahertz or a Pentium 3 500 megahertz. You can tell by the badge on the palm rest here that this is the Celeron variant. RAM was 64, 128 megabytes soldered, and you could upgrade it with 32, 64, 128 megabyte sticks. And this is SDRAM PC100. 12 gigabyte hard disk drives were in these, and believe it or not, it is a full-sized uh, disk drive in there. So when we take apart some of the components, we'll actually see that a huge amount of the chassis of this machine is actually being taken up by that hard drive. Last but not least, this whole thing is being driven by a very small battery, even for the time, and it was only a 1,550 milliamp battery. So this thing um, didn't really get a whole lot of runtime. As you can see, it's just this little guy right there. So with that being said, let's do a quick uh, tour of some of the ports and features of this machine. And to do that, we're going to put it under our uh, document camera here. So on the front of the machine, we have two latches, which hold it closed. On the left hand of the machine, we have a modem. We have what appears to be a lock slot. Uh, this would be used to connect the floppy disk drive. Three audio jacks, uh, one for microphone in, out, and then headphones. And then we have a card slot here. Uh, this would be specifically uh, PCMIA 8 or 16-bit cards. Along the back, we have the power plug, VGA, printer port, serial port. And then we had a place to plug in a PS2 mouse. And then we had USB 1.1 next to what would be the infrared port. Now, that USB, as far as I know, is not bootable. Um, and that would be USB 1.1. Now that we've done a bit of a tour of the ports, let's go ahead and flip this over and talk about the basic disassembly of the machine. So removal of the battery is pretty easy. We've got a pull catch and a locking lever. The battery will only come out this far and then a catch stops it and then you just lift it up and out. And again, this is a very, very small lithium ion battery. We have a cover over here, which is held down by one screw on the side and one screw on the top. And it's worth noting that these are not captive, they do come out. 
and you'll notice that there are two little arrows that indicate the unlock position uh, for this cover. So we push it out, we lift it up, and there is our Travel Star uh, 12 gigabyte hard drive. We'll put that off to the side and we'll put the screws with it. We'll need to remove this screw here and this screw here and this screw here and that should be enough to release the keyboard. So we're just going to turn this over and gently uh, shake those out of place. All right. And the keyboard lifts up from the top. And then folds forward. And then we've got a massive uh, connector on the board here, which can be yanked using these two green tabs and our keyboard comes free. This here would appear to be the uh, display ribbon cable. We have uh, some warning stickers over here. That's probably the 56K modem. And then here is our additional RAM slot. I suspect further disassembly would reveal a CMOS battery. And I think it's actually right here. That coiled cable is usually an indicator of a CMOS battery. Not always, but pretty good guess, which we won't be doing today uh, just because this thing is in pretty good shape. Let's reassemble this thing and, more excitingly, let's turn it on. All right, we've got everything plugged in. I do actually happen to have a floppy drive that fits. And I thought I would put this nice IBM design uh, book from Japan uh, just up behind as a bit of a homage given this machine's heritage. By the way, this is an excellent book. Lots of great pictures. There's an English translation insert as well. So don't, uh, don't feel afraid to track it down if you don't speak Japanese, because I certainly don't. All right, let's power this thing on. You can see our screen warming up here. This is an 800 by 600 uh, pixel display, so not super high res. And it's probably going to need its date and time reset. And one of the things I need to immediately get used to is the uh, keyboard uh, it doesn't have certain keys in the place you'd expect to find them. We'll up the brightness as far as it will go. Um, it's not super bright. When it was new, it may have been brighter. And interestingly enough, this machine is running Windows 2000 Professional. So this is not running a factory image. It is uh, running one that the person that did the restoration put together. So it's more or less a stock uh, version of Windows 2000 probably just to make it as usable as possible for the next owner, which in this case was me. And I could see how this would be a very, very popular uh, machine to use and own uh, just because of its size. I am no stranger uh, to sharing my love and appreciation for a small and compact machine. That battery, though, is probably its Achilles heel. I imagine that you wouldn't get a whole lot of life uh, out of that thing. But uh, what an interesting piece of tech just to see how small can you actually build a ThinkPad and still have it be as functional as possible. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed taking a quick look at this 240X. I think it'll be a fantastic addition uh, to my collection. And it kind of showcases two things. One, Japanese exclusive machines, uh, which there were several in the ThinkPad lineup. And that's not to be surprised given that the Yamato Design Labs uh, were located, of course, in Japan. Uh, but also, just a good example of how small you can build something and still maintain the core values of a specific brand. So they didn't compromise on things like the track point, the color screen, 
uh, the look of the case. Although some of the ports uh, sticking out at the edges and having to contour parts of the machine around them is definitely telling that they were being pushed to their absolute limits in terms of how small that they could make this thing and uh, it still live up to that ThinkPad name. I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.